Welcome everybody to tutorial number nine of this R tutorial series. Today we're going to be reviewing t-tests and one-way independent ANOVAs. We've got a lot of new content to cover, so let's um, let's get right into it. First, download the R code and data sets if you haven't already done so. Second, make sure you change your directory to the location in your computer where you save those files. And then finally, as I've said before, I want to always focus most of our time reviewing new functions and code rather than dwelling on previous code that we've gone through in detail in previous tutorials. So that means that if you do feel like you're getting lost when we're going quickly through some code that we've reviewed extensively in prior tutorials, then I recommend you look at those other tutorials to figure out what we're doing. So let's uh, begin with part one where I explain this new data set um we are analyzing so we're no longer going to be looking at the child aggression study data which of course was fake data and we're going to continue with some more fake data and this data is from a, a study i'm calling the alcohol and self-control study which had 48 participants and the purpose of the study was to see if there's sex differences in how alcohol affects self-control our outcome measure was this self-control scale um, ranging from zero to 100 points. And the higher your score, the more self-control you had, the lower the score, the more impulsive the person was. And um, <clears throat> we there's an experimental design here because we have two uh, factored uh, variables or, or two factors. Um, which are our so-called predictors or independent variables. And the first was alcohol intake, which you might think of as like alcohol dose, where uh, people either had no alcohol or no pints of beer, two pints of beer and four pints of beer. And then the other manipulation was the sex of the participants. So were they male or female? So the design of this study is ideal for demonstrating uh, ANOVAs, and we're going to therefore be playing with this data for the next three tutorials. So we are going to, well, first of all, we've got to load the packages and disable scientific notation, and we're going to set the directory. And then we're going to load this new data set into a data frame, which we're calling DAT. And then the first thing I want to draw your attention to is the fact that notice how the two um, independent variables are these characters. And uh, that's a problem because we need to actually transform them into factored variables so that they can be used in our analysis of variance. So what these lines of code are doing are transforming these character variables into factored variables, which we've already gone through in detail previously. And we're using the relevel function for both to set the reference category for sex to be female and the reference category for the uh, for alcohol to be no alcohol. So let's run that line of code. And then we're going to use the attributes function, which we've seen before, to confirm that what we did worked. And it shows here that for sex, we have two levels. The first um, level that's listed is the reference category, which is female, and it's confirming that it's a factored variable. And similarly for alcohol, the first level listed is none, and it's also a factored variable. So let's get into uh, some descriptive statistics and a preliminary plot. So we're going to use the describe function uh, from the psych package, which we've seen before to describe the outcome measure. And we get a sense of the, you know, the central tendency, the overall mean around 60 with the standard deviation and the median, as well as some other descriptive statistics. I didn't uh, report the interquartile range, but you could add that if you're interested. Another thing I, um, that's really important to check when you're analyzing um, and uh, when you're going to use an analysis of variance for experimental designs uh, is to know whether or not the data is balanced. If you don't know why that's important, then I'm uh, then you should watch our lecture on ANOVAs, where or a series of lectures really on ANOVAs, where we explain why balanced versus unbalanced designs matter. So a balanced design, in short, is when you have the same number of participants per level um, of each factor or not. So we're let's just run this code. So we see that there's eight participants per level of each factor. So this is a fully balanced design. The next line of code, we just want to get an overall sense. Is there any missing data? No, there's not. That's very good. So as um, 
I think most people would recommend this before you analyze any data, plot your data. Um, you got to visualize it before you, you know, start using special and uh, special tests and fancy tools to analyze it. So let's plot our data. Um, you could do a variety of different plots, you know, a histogram, scatter plot, etc. We're going to do just one plot, um, and we're going to do a scatter, a special kind of scatter plot. So we've already done a lot of plots already in ggplot so all this code we've gone through before so the first main ggplot function we're setting the data frame the x and y variables which are going to be our x and y axis we're setting our cartesian coordinates or our y limits and it's automatically going to generate the x axis limit so we don't need to do that and we're setting the tick marks and the labels the new function that you haven't seen before is this new is this geom called geom jitter what this is, is it's a, it's a type of scatter plot where, um, but the difference is, is that it, it, it introduces what's called a jitter, which you can think of as a kind of spread in the, um, in the actual individual points. Now, why would you want to do that? You would want to do that particularly when plotting experimental design data, because all, generally speaking, if you were to do a scatter plot, the the individual dots would often overlap and it would be hard to see the individual participant data. So by using geom jitter, we're doing a scatter scatter plot by but by introducing a random spread among the different uh, dots, we can get a sense of you know where each participant is scoring. So the first value here is the shape of the the um uh the dots. So you can look up the graphical parameters in the uh, website that I provided in one of the early introductory tutorials. So 16 just refers to a solid circle. It's going to be size two. And this is the key, um, uh, the key option within the geom jitter that sets the actual spread. So width is the, is a parameter you can play around with, play around with. And the larger the number, the larger the spread. And what the, we're also applying an aesthetic mapping to basically have different colors based off of the sex of the participants so that we can see not only the different um, individual scores of each participant depending on the dose of alcohol they received, but also their sex. So let's run this, uh, this plot and you'll see what it ends up producing. So at least I think this is a nice little plot. We have a scatter plot, but because of the jitter function, we spread out the data so we can get a better sense of where each participant is lying overall. And um, I do want to mention, because the width uh, option is a random number, if you were to run this line of code again and again, you'll get somewhat different scatters because, again, it, it's a random number that is generating the spread within the um, dots. So I have two questions here, just things, food for thought to think about as we're going through these next three tutorials, since we're analyzing this data. First, I want you to look at the scatter plot and ask yourself, does it suggest there might be a main effect of sex or alcohol? Meaning overall, regardless of a person's amount of alcohol, are there sex differences in their impulsivity scores? Similarly for alcohol, overall, regardless of sex, um, does uh, do higher doses of alcohol uh, are they associated with, with uh, uh, less self-control? And then also finally, you know, is there an interaction between alcohol and sex? So just things to think about uh, as we're going through this, um, these tutorials. So let's jump into the humble t-test. So we'll scroll down here and we'll minimize this plot. So, you know, the humble t-test, great test. Um, we're gonna use it here. Oh, technically it's not the right analysis. Uh, given the experimental design and what we, you know, what we really want to, what we ought to do, but I'm just showing this for teaching purposes. So this is an uh, between subjects design, so an independent ANOVA. So we're going to use an independent samples t-test. So there's two main types, the student's t-test and the Welch's t-test. If any of you have taken stats before, you may know that the big difference between them is that 
the student's t-test assumes equal variance between the groups, whereas the Welch's t-test does not. Um, and so you set that option as either true or false, and that's how you get either students or Welch's t-test. The other lines of code underneath this built-in t-test function is something that I've written. Now, I'll, I'll show you why I've written this code, and, and hopefully, um, yeah, hopefully it'll make sense. So let's just run the student's t-test, and I'll show you the, the automatic output it generates. So I just typed in M. So this is the student's t-test. It shows that there's non-significant difference between the sexes, but here's my problem. It's rounding all of these numbers. And if it's not clear by now, I'm a little bit obsessive compulsive when it comes to data analysis. And I actually really want to know what those numbers are and I don't want them rounded definitely not to one decimal place. So that's bothersome for me. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna define a arbitrary variable called data and I'm creating a vector, and I'm going to use, because it's, you know, the t-test creates a list, I'm going to extract all the relevant information from that list, like the t-test, like the, I mean, the t-statistic, the standard error, the p-value, etc. And I'm going to turn that vector into a matrix. And it's going to be a matrix with one row, one row, and six columns. So one row is just, uh, I'm going to say it's the student's t-test is the name of that row, and each column is going to correspond to the different um, the different uh, statistics that I took out of the uh, st uh, out of the t-test. So let's run all that code and see what it generates. So there, that's a little bit nicer output. It actually tells you without rounding it, you know, the, all the relevant information like the T statistic, it's standard error, the mean of group zero, which remember the reference category is female. So I know that group zero is female and the mean of group one, which is male. So there's a slight difference. You know, males seem to be somewhat more impulsive, but it's not a statistically significant difference. And that's regardless of how much alcohol they drink. But again, not statistically significant. So don't read into that. And also this is fake data. Uh, Welch's t-test, it's the exact same, except we've we've made the variance uh, unequal. Uh, we're not assuming equal variance. And, and otherwise, it's exactly the same. So let's run that. And notice that the information is exactly the same. Those of you who've done statistics would know that. But the big difference is the degrees of freedom. It's less. And that, of course, affects the p-value, so it's somewhat different. Paired samples t-test, we don't actually have repeated measures or matched data, so that means that I can't technically show you, but I'm just going to tell you how you would do it. So you use the same t-test function, and it accepts data either in wide or long format. If you don't know what that means, in brief, wide format is when you have one row per subject, and you have levels of the repeated measures or matched samples as separate columns. So let's say you have a repeated measure called time, and there's two levels of that um, repeated measure called pretreatment and post-treatment. Um, and those are going to be separate columns in wide format. To do the t-test of wide format data, you would do uh, each, you use the comma. So you put uh, one of the levels uh, before the comma, one of the levels after the comma, you put your data frame, and then you'd make paired equals true because it's a paired sample t-test. For wide format, the big difference is, is you actually have a formula where essentially you're saying the outcome is predicted by time, this predictor, so to speak. And time will have two levels, pretreatment and post-treatment. And again, you make paired equals true. Uh, now, let's get into the main part of this tutorial, which is the uh, one-way independent ANOVA. So the first part I'm going to, or the part four technically, is uh, uh, I'm going to show you how you, I do an independent ANOVA using the AFEX package. And there's two ways I do independent ANOVAs or one-way independent ANOVAs in R. First is with the AOV4 function within the AFEX package, which is a great package. And then uh, our familiar LM function with the ANOVA, capital A ANOVA, I should emphasize, function from the CAR package. Um, the reason why you can use both, if you don't already know this, is because an ANOVA is a linear model. In fact, a one-way ANOVA is just a type of multiple regression. And you'll see why shortly if you don't already know. Um, or at least the underlying math is like a multiple regression. So here's the PDF of the AFEX package. I encourage you to look at it, specifically look at the section of the AOV4 function and read it. Um, that way you understand how the AOV4 works. But hopefully what I'm going to explain in this tutorial will clarify everything. Before I get into 
how you do the one-way independent ANOVA looking at um, specifically uh, alcohol. I want to point out five things that I think are important to know about how the AOV4 function works. First, it must include a single error term, which is uh, defined by brackets, and then you put various things where the dot, dot, dot are or is, and then you have the vertical line, and then you have your ID column, and this is your participant ID column. Within the dot, dot, dot uh, uh, section of the error term, you could uh, potentially put uh, the within subject factors if they are present. But even if you have no within subject factors, you must put this particular error term, and I'll show you how you define it in a moment. Second, factors outside of the error term are treated as between subject factors, and within subject factors are specified within the error term itself. And in our tutorial on repeated measures, I show how that actually happens. Um, thirdly, type three sums of squares is the default sums of squares that the AFEX package uses when calculating the F statistics of an ANOVA. If that doesn't mean anything to you, please look at our introduction to statistics lectures um, where we specifically the factorial ANOVA um, lecture where we actually explain what different sums of squares mean. You should know what it means because it's very important. And I'm mentioning it here because I think it's often jarring um, and perhaps even confusing for, um, S, for, for instance, SPSS users who switch over to R because the default in SPSS, and I believe also in, in SAS, is to use type three sums of squares. And then when they go to R, the, one of the standard built-in ANOVA function, ANOVA functions, which is called AO, I'm just typing it in the console, AOV, um, uses by default type one sums of squares, which uh, they'll see that their, their F statistics are all off, they're totally different, and it can be very confusing and jarring. So the AFEX package developers use type three sums of squares as the default to make the transition, I think, a little bit seamless for people who are transitioning to R. But it is important to know that there is a lively debate about which is the best one to use, um, whether type three and type two specifically for analyzing experimental designs. I, generally speaking though, I think it's fair to say that type three sums of squares is a reasonable option. Fourth, AOV4 returns multiple objects. Um, and you're gonna see in a moment what I mean by this. So it returns the AOV object, an ANOVA object, capital A ANOVA object, and also very importantly, the uh, uh, LM object. So the same LM function that we saw in our tutorials when we were looking at linear regression. And you'll see why in particular, the LM object is very helpful. And lastly, number five, the AOV4 object returns an object which can be directly passed into a function called EM means, which stands for estimated marginal means from a package called EM means. And this package is extremely useful. And we use it in this tutorial and also all of our other tutorials on ANOVA, including the repeated measures ANOVA. And this package is extremely useful principally because it allows us to do post hoc testing and planned contrasts, which is very helpful. And I encourage you to look at, I've provided two links to look, uh, to give you tutorials on, further tutorials, I mean, on how to use EM means. And these are, I think, really helpful. So let's actually get to our one-way ANOVA of uh, self-control scores uh, as a function of how much alcohol a person uh, drinks, regardless of their sex. So it's a one-way independent ANOVA because it's a between subjects design. And the way we use it is very similar. The general form, I mean, of the AOV4, form, the AOV4 form function is generally similar to the LM function, which we saw which we're now very familiar with, which has this form of you first you put the formula and then you have your data. Here we have type where we define our sums of squares, the type we want. So if we wanted type three, we would just put three. In the case of a one-way ANOVA, it makes no difference whether you put type two or type three. I'm just putting type two. But if you put type three, it'll produce the exact same uh, output. So our formula though is is a little bit different from what we were familiar with with the LM function. So we have uh, our self-control, our outcome measure being predicted by this so-called predictor or independent variable uh, alcohol, which has three levels, and we have to specify our error term. And in 
independent design ANOVAs, whether that be a one-way ANOVA or a factorial ANOVA. You specify the error term by putting a one with the vertical line and the ID column. So these are the participant IDs. So let's run this code. And I'm gonna draw your attention to this, uh, I suppose, warning sign. Nothing bad has happened. It's just informing you that the contrast has been autom have been automatically set to what's called contrast sum for the following variables, alcohol, which is our only independent variable. So uh, we go into detail about this in our tutorial on factorial ANOVAs, but what this is doing is defining automatically orthogonal contrasts. Um, if that doesn't mean anything to you, I encourage you to, again, watch our, our, our um, lecture on ANOVAs, uh, specifically factorial ANOVA, when we go into what uh, um, Oh, factorial and I mean the one-way ANOVA, both of those lectures, we talk about them where we go into detail about what an orthogonal contrast is and why it's important. Um, I also briefly go into detail in our factorial ANOVA, our tutorial as to why having an orthogonal contrast is particularly important for type 3 sums of squares. So I'm just flagging that for you so you know because it is actually very important. Now let's see what the result of this um, of this ANOVA was. So let's run the summary function. You can just apply that generic function. And what we have is an ANOVA table where, where it says type two sums of squares and we have our predictor or independent variable. We have the degrees of freedom of that um, model. And then we have the degrees of freedom of the residual. We have the, um, uh, and then we have the F statistic, which, and then we have the generalized eta squared and its corresponding uh, p value or the corresponding p value I mean of the f statistics. So what this shows is is that there we have a significant f test of alcohol, but as you probably know, we don't know exactly what is driving that significant f test. Meaning we don't know uh, which of the various groups is uh, statistically significantly different from each other. So how can we figure that out? So this is where the EM means uh, package is very useful. So first it has a built, it has a plot, which allows you to automatically plot um, uh, the result of your model. So it's EMIP, which I believe stands for interaction plot. The way it works is the first argument, the, an argument is just another term for, you know, the first thing you put in within a function. So the first argument is the model. And then you can put the interaction. In our case, we're just putting the main effect and uh, it's going to plot each of the estimated marginal means of each level of that, um, of, that fact, of that factor. And then it's gonna plot its confidence intervals and we're setting the X and Y uh, axis label. So let's run that line of code. So <clears throat> here we have our plot, Y axis self-control uh, scores, and then we have our levels of the factor uh, alcohol and we have our confidence intervals so what this very clearly shows without even doing the post hoc testing <clears throat> since these are 95 percent confidence intervals which aren't overlapping is that there's no significant difference between no alcohol and two pints in terms of people's overall self-control they seem to be largely they're they're able to keep it together for lack of a better term but as people drink uh more alcohol specifically four pints of beer they become much more impulsive, which I think is fair to say corresponds with many people's lived experience. So, but let's actually, that's just the plot. So let's actually get the estimated marginal means in the post hoc um, comparison. So here uh, we're gonna go through the, these uh, lines of code and what we have is one function and it produces two um, objects. So the function we're defining as this arbitrary variable, which means something to me, just post hocs, could call it whatever you want, but the function is the em means function from the package. And the what we're doing with this function is we're going to get the pairwise comparisons, which is doing various t-tests comparing each level of the factor alcohol. And the way we do that, the first argument we say, uh, we, we, we tell em means which model to look at. And then in the specification, uh, uh, argument, we say that we want to do pairwise comparisons and the squiggly line uh, basically allows us to say for the factor uh, alcohol. 
And then for the model, the, this is how it's actually going to be calculating the pairwise comparisons. We're using a univariate model. I mentioned this because that is the default for the EM means. It is important, particularly for repeated measures analyses, and I'm going to get into this in our R tutorial about a repeated measures ANOVA. You actually should make the um, model a multivariate model in a repeated measures ANOVA because a multivariate model is um, is able to better handle violations of sphericity. If that doesn't mean anything to you, don't worry. Um, listen to our lecture on repeated measures ANOVA and uh, also look at our, our tutorial on repeated measures ANOVA and mixed designs ANOVA. I've made your lives hopefully a little bit easier because I've um, also made options here for you to adjust the p-values for multiple comparisons, which you should do um, in post-hoc testing because we have no prior planned contrast. So we want to control the, po uh, the false positive rate. So uh, this is a common one, Tukey's HSD. Um, you can adjust for Tukey's HSD by um, using this argument. If you wanted to adjust, for example, for Bonferroni, you can use uh, this argument. If you wanted to do FDR or false discovery rate adjustment, you can um, use this uh, um, argument. And then if you wanted to have no adjustment, you just wanted the raw p-values, you can do that as well. And the way you can uh, cycle through these options is just by commenting um, or uncommenting the option that you want and then running the whole code. So I'm just going to undo that. And we're just going to do Tukey's HSD as our post hoc adjustments or or p-value adjustment. So let's run that. It didn't produce anything, but there is something within this very, oops, sorry, let's type in the console. There is something in the this variable post hocs, post hocs, let's, it's a list. So we have the estimated marginal means and the contrasts. So let's, and I've written out the code here. So we have the estimated marginal means. Um, if that doesn't mean anything to you, or if that just seems very strange to you, um, what estimated marginal means means, not to, yeah, too many means in one sentence. Basically what EMM is are the means based off of the model. So they're not simply the raw means of the data. Uh, these are actually more important than the raw means of the data because it's the estimated marginal means that your statistical model is using to calculate its statistics. So these are the ones that actually you should be reporting in my opinion. Um, so let's actually get them. So uh, here we have the output of the EM mean. So it shows you the uh, the overall group mean of, or the group mean of each level of the factor alcohol. So the average impulsivity of both no alcohol and the two pints of beer groups are approximately the same around 64. And they have the upper and lower confidence intervals of those means. And then for the four pint group, we see, a, you know, consistent with the graph that there's about a 20 point difference or reduction in people's uh, uh, self-control as they drink more beer, and they clearly get much more impulsive. And finally, to get the contrast, so the contrast function is basically our post hoc comparisons. Um, just ignore that for a second. I just want to show you something. So let's actually just show what the standard D, uh, 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 the standard output of the contrast function would be without this sort of fancy thing that you see afterwards. So what you see is the uh, post hoc comparisons with the two key, sorry, two key method adjusted p values comparing no pints to two pints, no pints to four pints and two pints to four pints. And what you see consistent with the graph is that there's no significant difference between the no pints and two pints condition, but there is a significant difference um, even after controlling for multiple comparisons between four pints and no pints and two pints. Again, that's a lot of pints in one sentence. Now, notice that the estimates, so the estimates are just the group, are, are just the difference of the means. And notice that there isn't um, upper and lower confidence intervals around those estimates. If that's something that you don't like, well, I've provided we provided you with a function to get those upper and lower confidence intervals. And you're probably looking at that very strange um, operator, which I've just highlighted because I've never used this operator before in this, in this tutorial series. So I'm going to explain it. I personally don't use this operator a lot um, just because I haven't gotten into the habit of doing so, but it is actually kind of useful. It's called a pipe. And what a pipe does is, in essence, 
allows you to, it's a shorthand for not having to put brackets around things, which allows you to make, allows your code to not be so long and complicated. So what this pipe does is say, I want you to apply this function, the summary function to this function without having to put the summary around the function. So you have sort of nested functions within each other, which can be a little bit hard to read. That's all it does. It doesn't change anything else. It just makes it a bit easier to read. So let's apply that. In the summary function, we're putting inference equals true, which allow, which will, um, which will calculate the 95% confidence intervals around the estimates, which again are the difference of means. And that's what we see here. The lower confidence interval and the uh, upper uh, limit of the confidence interval. Now, um, let's actually make a plot of our one-way ANOVA. Um, that's maybe a bit nicer than this, the automatic plot we just reviewed. So first of all, you actually need to convert this, this the output of the EM means, which is called an EM grid object, into a data frame, because otherwise you can't extract the means, standard errors, or confidence intervals that we see, sorry, that we see here. We can't actually get that based off of the default output. So what we need to do is force R to transform it into a data frame. And the way we do that is with our familiar as data frame, as data frame uh, function, which forces uh, R to convert this EM grid into a data frame. And we're calling this new data frame means. So let's run that. And let's look at what means is. And it's exactly the same, except now it's technically a data frame, the underlying formatting. Now, why is that important? So let's actually, it's important because we want to plot that data using ggplot. Now, I am I wanted to take time to do this because I want to show you something that I've alluded to in previous tutorials, that you don't actually need to define your data and x and y variables within the main function of a ggplot. So notice here, I'm, I've defined the main function of the ggplot without doing what I've typically done, which is say, this is the data frame and these are the x and y coordinates. The reason why is because I don't want them, I don't want to have a data frame in X and Y coordinates to apply to every layer of the graph. Rather, I want to customize each layer to plot different data from different data frames. And I'm going to show you how. So the first part of this, um, of, a, of this uh, function, you are already very familiar with, so I won't go over it. But here we have a new function, which basically puts the legend at the bottom. And we are familiar now with the geom jitter, but I am going to slow down here because this is new. Notice I'm defining now the data frame within the geom, within this layer. So I'm saying the data that we're going to be plotting for the geom jitter only is going to be the main data frame that we've been using so far, the dat. And we're going to plot um, circles. So that's what 16 stands for, the shape 16. They're going to be size two and we're putting a jitter so you know a random spread so we can see those individual participant data we have an alpha level which stands for the trend it's a transparency parameter so we're making them a little bit uh see-through um and you'll see why because i uh basically i want to overlay another dot on top and i don't want these uh, many dots to overwhelm to, to um overwhelm the graph so to speak and we define our aesthetic mapping. So we say we want to plot this data and on the uh, this data frame. And on the x-axis, we're going to use the alcohol um, uh, column. And on the y-axis, we're using self-control. And crucially, we are going to change the color as a function of different levels of alcohol. So let's just see what this plot up until now do, does. So what it's done is get, it's plotted these semi-transparent um, scatter plots for each level of alcohol. And we have the um, legend now at the bottom. And uh, notice that the color is uh, different depending on the level of alcohol, which is exactly what we wanted. And what we want, what I want to do in the next line of code is I want to overlay, an overlay another layer on top of this using different, using a different data frame. And I want to overlay the estimated marginal means for each level of the factor alcohol. And that's what the geom point does. So I'm going to do, you know, a, a scatter plot, so to speak, but with just three values. So our data is going to be the means and the size of those circles are going to be a bit bigger than the jitter ones. So they're going to be four. And again, we're saying the x axis is going to be alcohol. The y axis is going to be EM mean, which 
If we look at our means data frame, EM mean just is the self-control um, scores, but it's the actual estimated marginal mean of those scores. And then again, we want the colors to vary as a function of the level of alcohol. So let's run that line of code and see how things have changed. And you see it's added another layer to this plot with the estimated marginal means using a different data frame because we haven't actually specified the data in the main function, which is which has allowed us to create this more complex um, plot. And then finally, we want, or at least I would like to get some 95% confidence intervals around those estimated marginal means, and they are in our new data frame called means. So uh, we're going to use the geom called geom error bar, which is how you can plot 95% confidence intervals or, or even standard error bars, whatever. And we're saying we're going to say that the data is going to be from this new data frame called means, called means and the, the width parameter um, I'm setting to zero. If it's not zero, what ends up happening is, and I'm going to show you in a second, it typically error bars will have a kind of hat on, on either end of them. I personally don't like that, so I'm setting it to zero, but I'll show you what happens when you don't. And size one is the size of the line. And again, we're saying that the X axis will be alcohol, the y-axis will be uh, essentially self-control uh, self uh, scores, which is the means of those uh, groups. And then crucially to define the upper and lower confidence intervals, we're saying the y-minimum is the lower CL column, which again, if we look at our means, that's this column. So it's going to take that to plot the lower confidence interval or lower limit of the confidence interval. And then similarly for y-max, y-max, it's going to take those values for the upper limit of the confidence interval. And again, we want the color to vary as a function of level of alcohol. So let's run that. And then we see, let's maximize it. So you see the bar is a bit better. So we have these nice little 95% confidence intervals. And I think a nice little plot that's a bit better than this uh, default plot that EM means uh, will generate. Now, I said I'd show you what width does. So let's say we wanted to actually have the um the little hats on top so i'm setting width to 2.5 so you'll see what i mean by the hats in a second so there you go you know some people like that i personally don't um yeah so i set that to zero but if you like them that's great you can you can set that to a non-zero value now in preparation for testing whether or not parametric test assumptions have met we need to extract the residuals and since we're doing it, also the predicted values of our ANOVA, which we can do. But, and there's a big but here, it's a somewhat different process when using the AOV4 object. The reason why, and I explain this in this little comment here, is because of the fact that, um, especially when you have a repeated measures or within subject factor, AOV4 will um, generate a data frame where uh, if you use the standard method that I showed you in previous tutorials on linear regression, where you take the M and then you do a dollar sign and then you just pick out the residuals and the fitted values, it actually won't necessarily align with the corresponding observed values. So in order to make sure that um, happens, so the, in order to make sure there is a correspondence mm -hmm. and they all line up, you kind of need to do a somewhat convoluted um, process, which I explain here. So first, we use, and I believe this is a built-in function called fitted. You define the model and then crucially append equals true. So what this is going to do is take the fitted values and attach it onto the observed values. So let's run this line of code and we're defining this new data frame called new dat. So let's look at it. And there you go. It's our, you know, 48 participants. We got their self-control scores and then we have their fitted values, which just are the estimated marginal means since those are the predicted values for each level of the factor alcohol. Similarly for residuals, we, there's a, and again, I, this is the built-in function. We, we, for the first argument, we say the model, which is our AOV4 model and append equals true. And I'm making this arbitrary, um, variable called residuals underscore TMP, which is just a custom I've gotten, I've, uh, I've acquired over the last number of years of defining temporary variables with TMP standing for temporary because I'm going to do something with that variable. So what does that show? So what it shows is the exact same table, but it's only plotting the residuals. So what I actually really want to do is take the residuals and 
attach them to this data frame so that I have both the fitted values or predicted values and the residuals. And that's what I'm doing here. We've seen this function before. I say I'm picking out the residuals and then I'm attaching it to as a, as a new column to the new DAP data frame. And I'm using the dot residuals simply to line up with the fact that this says dot fitted, but you don't have to do dot. And now let's see what this new data frame looks like. Great. So we have the fitted values and the residuals, which again are just the observed um, self-control scores uh, minus the predicted self-control scores, which are just the, the estimated marginal means of each group. Now let's do parametric test assumptions. So this is just all the very same familiar tests we've seen with multiple linear regression. We want to look at the histogram of our residuals, which we've just extracted from our new DAT data frame. Let's plot the histogram. We don't have many observations, so our, you know, our, yeah, so the histogram is, uses wider bins, but it looks approximately normal, which is reassuring. And then we can use this really nice auto plot function to get nice diagnostic plots. But I want to draw your attention to something different. Look how I've used M dollar sign LM. Remember above when I mentioned that the AOV4 function will automatically generate multiple different objects, such as AOV, an ANOVA, and an LM. This is why this is uh, very helpful, because if I was to do auto plot and just directly apply that to my AOV4 function, I get, uh, I get an error message because it's not supported. But because the AOV4 function generates a LM object, I can apply that object, which is the exact same underlying mathematical model um, of the one-way ANOVA. I can apply that object to the auto plot to get the diagnostic plots. So let's do that. Uh, well, I actually I don't need to type it out in the console. I've just uh, I've written it out here. So, and I'm going to get those same four plots that I find are the most helpful. And we've gone over this, and you can ignore that. Um, this warning message because it doesn't actually matter. And, you know, we've gone over this, so I won't dwell on it. It shows the raw residual plot, the normal QQ plot, the scale location plot, and the Cook's distance. Basically, it shows that linearity assumption is met. So is homogeneity of variance. The normal QQ plot looks approximately normal. The scale location plot confirms the linearity and homogeneity of variance that we saw in the raw residual plot. And the Cook's distance show that, you know, none of the Cook's distances are above one. So likely there's no major your influential observation. So that's all really great. And now we can do, uh, we can describe our residuals to get us the quantitative measures of skew and kurtosis, which confirm what we saw in the QQ plot, that there's, you know, likely nothing to worry about in terms of significant skew or kurtosis. And then, of course, the statistical tests of normality tell the same story. They're all non-significant, telling us that there's no evidence that the residuals are not normal. So that's great. And that comes at the end of um, how you do a one-way independent ANOVA using the AFEX package. The last part will go quickly because, honestly, all of this code is exactly the same as the AFEX package. The only difference is here. So the LM function, we're very familiar with it. The reason why you can use it, if you don't already know, the reason why you can use it for um, an ANOVA is because an ANOVA is a linear model. And it's specifically an independent ANOVA is a linear model. In fact, it's just a multiple regression with dummy coded predictors. That's it. So you can use the linear model, which we're very familiar with already. Uh, the formula is you have for the one-way ANOVA is you have your outcome variable, your predictor alcohol, and you have your data frame. So we run that model. It's going to get the parameter estimates to actually calculate the F statistic of the uh, alcohol factor. You use the capital A ANOVA function from the car package, and we're saying type two sums of squares. And it calculates it. So we have, uh, you know, the sums of squares of the um, model and the residuals. And our model, of course, is the alcohol uh, predictor and the degrees of freedom of the model and the residuals and its associated F st statistic, which is, of course, the exact same that the AOV4 function found because it's the exact same test. And it's type two sums of squares, sorry. And then you have the p-value. I'm going to show you this contrast that so I'm going to show you the contrast of the alcohol. And the reason why I'm doing this is just to show you that R will automatically generate dummy codes. 
for um, which will then be fed into the linear model, which produces the parameter estimates. So we know that no alcohol is the reference category. So the dummy codes are basically comparing each level of the factor, each level of the factor uh, alcohol with the reference category of no alcohol. So the first dummy code is comparing two pints with no pints, and the second dummy code is comparing four pints with no pints. And we can actually get those parameter estimates by just doing the regular old summary function of our linear model. And there you go, we have our multiple linear regression, except our coefficients are, our unstandardized coefficients are just the um, difference of the means between the reference category and the two and four pints respectively. Um, and essentially the, the, the slope is just that. The slope is the difference between the reference category and the particular particular level being considered. And it gives you their T statistics and their corresponding P values. So let's, let's actually explore this further. Um, we can apply the same function of the EMIP to get the, to plot the main effect with this automatic plot. And it's the exact same plot, which is unsurprising because it's the exact same mathematic, the, the, the exact same maths is underlying uh, the linear model. We can get the post hoc comparisons using the exact same test. So let's run that. We've already seen this. And then we have our estimated marginal means, which are exactly the same. And in case you don't believe me that a one-way independent de Nova is just a multiple regression with dummy codes, uh, I'll just show you. So if you, let's just take the difference between no pints, which is our reference category, and two pints, it's 0.9, which is exactly the, S, the unstandardized coefficient or slope between no pints and two pints. Similarly, let's take our reference category, no pints, and compare it to uh, four pints. And what do we get? We get 17.2, which is exactly the unstandardized coefficient for this predictor, which is just the slope between the reference category and the four pints. And that's, by the way, statistically significant. Um, but since we wanted to do pairwise comparisons, we can apply the exact same uh, function and get the confidence intervals around those differences of means. So we have our contrast of no pints to two pints. And again, it's the exact same statistics we saw above with the uh, AOV4 function. And the p-values are slightly different from the output from the linear model, just because these are adjusted for multiple comparisons. And finally, sorry, I just need a drink of water. <clears throat> I've been talking too much, my throat is dry. Um, we can extract the residuals and predicted values using the same functions that we saw for the linear regression, which we're going to do, and we're going to attach those to our data frame as we've already seen before. And there you go, our predicted values, which just are the estimated marginal means of each group. And then the residuals are the difference between the self-control scores and the predicted self-control scores. And then finally, we can apply all the same parametric test assumptions tests, I suppose you might say, to the linear model, because this is what we saw when we were analyzing um, in our tutorial on linear regression analysis. So we can plot those residuals and we get our nice histogram. And again, we can use the residual, the, the auto plot, but we don't need to do the fancy M uh, dollar sign LM because this is the linear model. So we don't, we can just skip that little step and then we get the exact same auto plot with those, um, nice uh, diagnostics, which tell us the exact same story. And then finally, uh, let's just run all of that. We can get the descriptives of the residuals, which are exactly the same because it's the exact same test. And similarly, the uh, statistical tests of normality. Okay, we've covered a lot of territory. Thank you for your patience. I hope this was helpful. Um, and that is basically how you can do a one-way independent ANOVA using either the AFEX package with the AOV4 function and the LM function. In our next tutorial, we are going to continue to explore the alcohol and self-control study data, but looking at planned contrasts. And uh, after that, we're actually going to analyze this data properly by doing a factorial ANOVA because this is actually a factorial design. Um, but I wanted to have a separate uh, tutorial on one-way ANOVAs because I think it's, it helps you introduce, helps to introduce you to these core functions, but we're going to be building on all the things that we've learned. So thank you very much. I really appreciate you taking the time to listen to this tutorial, and I hope it's helpful. And um, in the meantime, take care. Bye.